and resume recording. Okay, now that we are recording, let me just say a big welcome to everybody. My name again is Rochelle Hood, um, Vice President of the chapter. Um, so it's delighted to have everyone today, some new folks and a lot of returning visitors um, for this evening, our monthly meeting. Uh, so tonight, just to give you a little highlight on the agenda, we're, we've just finished our birder chat, getting some update on what people are doing this weekend, what they've seen. Um, from this, I'm going to introduce our president, who's gonna give you a couple updates in general, uh, related to the chapter and then also related to um, the Merritt Island National Wildlife Refuge. Uh, we always feature that. Um, from there, then we're going to have um, Bert come back on the stage again, as I like to say, and give us some updates about past and upcoming field trips and activities. Um, then you'll be back to me and you'll hear a little bit about the next meeting that we have coming up in the fall. Um, and then I will welcome to the stage our <laughs> keynote speaker speecher this evening. Um, I am going to, um, if you guys can mute yourself on your devices in just a moment, I'm going to uh, mute everybody. Uh, let me do that real quick. And then we'll need to unmute our speakers. Let me go and mute everyone else. And welcome, John. I saw that you just came in. Um, all right. Okay. I'll keep doing that in the background. Um, so. Before um, I turn over to Bert, let me first officially have Jim open the meeting and give you a couple of quick updates. Jim, over to you. Okay, am I unmuted or not? You are unmuted now. Okay. Uh, first of all, I'd like to again thank Rochelle for doing an excellent job in uh, setting up all our general and board meetings on Zoom. Had a very good array of programs, taking people to various places. Many of you don't get a chance to go to. So again, thanks, Rochelle. Okay, hopefully by fall, our general meetings will be in person again. We'll have to wait and see what happens, but we're looking forward to having open meetings. Uh, National and Audubon of Florida has not yet um, authorized that. And again, depending on what happens with the virus over the summer, we'll determine what we do there. Uh, one of the problems, though, if we do have open meetings, the church may or may not be available where we normally meet. They're going to decide this summer whether they're going to have any outside groups into their fellowship hall. And again, we'll just have to wait and see on that. If the church is not available, that's the uh, Presbyterian Church in Rockledge. We'll look to find, uh, try to find another venue where we can have in-person meetings. We uh, had our election last month. Most of you are aware of that, but our officers were reelected for another year. And according to our bylaws, the officers can serve three years, it's the third year for all of us. So next year, there'll be a completely a different set of officers. As far as the refuge goes, uh, Merritt Island National Wildlife Refuge, it's open. The two main things, the uh, Black Point Wildlife Drive, the Biolab Road are the two uh, roads that are open. Uh, there's a few birds there, nothing particularly outstanding, but right now we're in this right in the middle or maybe a low past the big migration of the uh, semi-palmated sandpipers. They're one of the low peep, so-called peep sandpipers they come through in huge numbers in the spring as they're going north and again in the fall as they're going back south. They're normally not there, so you just have a short time in either spring or fall to see them. But they are there and they're in good numbers right now. And the uh, usual wading birds, the herons, egrets on ibises are there. But uh, to my knowledge, there's nothing really outstanding there now in terms of the rare species. So with that, I'll turn it back over to Rochelle. All right, Jim, thank you so much for that update. Um, and um, now we're gonna hear about field trips, both the ones that have gone by, some of the highlights from there and what's coming up. So I'll turn it over to Bert. And Bert, you're still on mute. Yep, there, there we go. There you go, all right, thank you. <laughs> All right, so uh, as we're, not all of you were there, we just 
did Deleon Springs uh, State Park and we did the boat tour. That was yesterday. We ended up with only 11 members attending, but we all had a great time. We saw uh, four barred owls, two, two juveniles, uh, two, two adults, and uh, there was a limpkin, bald eagle. Uh, the boat tour uh, took us uh, down the river a ways and uh, we got to see a few, a few of the wading birds down there, the egrets and herons. Uh, several osprey eating eating their fish. It was a lot of fun. And then we capped that off by going over to the Sugar Mill restaurant and uh, I pigged out on pancakes and a few others had uh, 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 different pairs, but uh, uh, it was really a, a, a fun time and uh, I wish I had a little bit more time to stay there that day, but on we go. On the 16th, we uh, had work day in the hollows. We had uh, Five members attend, uh, four of them uh, were down working on the Audubon Garden. And a great big thank you to Pat Touchberry being uh, our, our lead uh, uh, Audubon Garden uh, worker. She, she's out there uh, quite, you know, not only on the special work dates that we have, but even when she uh, uh, has some time to come out and, um, and I've gotten to meet a lot of her family because she, uh, uh, brings them out and uh, let, teaches them how to help in the garden. And we really appreciate that. But it was nice to have uh, uh, more members out there and helped uh, uh, out at the KVB garden, uh, the North Garden up by Rock Springs Gate. And so it was a, a great day and we had a lot of fun. On May 8th, we had a big day and uh, we had 22 members uh, that signed up. Uh, that, that, that was a lot of fun. I, I got to I, I did do a big day. I spent 11 hours uh, out birding at nine different locations and uh, really saw a lot of different birds. Uh, so it was a, a lot of fun. On the 18th, we had Frog Watch in the Hollows. Uh, we had Alana Wood from the Brevard Zoo come out. Uh, she leads the Frog Watch program at the Brevard Zoo. And we had uh, uh, five of our SEAS members uh, come out there plus uh, several others. Uh, from 100 Acre Hollows. Uh, only heard uh, two frogs, the cr cricket frogs and the southern toads, uh, but they thought they may have heard another one, uh, but they weren't uh, positive. And we think there might be bats in the bat houses. So uh, uh, we're, we're hoping that that's a, a positive sign. There was, looked like there was some guano be beneath one of them. And um, we saw bats flying that night. So we're keeping our fingers crossed. And then on uh, April 17th, we had uh, Audubon Florida Birdathon, and we had 20 members sign up for that one. That was another kind of big day for me because I dr was driving back from uh, Fort Myers Beach. So I did a West Coast to East Coast uh, um, birding adventure and picked up the, um, the whooping cranes in Polk County. So that was a, a nice lifer for me to, to get. It took we made several attempts at that and fi finally got them. So now more importantly, the upcoming events. Um, tomorrow we've got the Sea Rocket Native Plant Sale. Um, so that's just an announcement for, for people that would like to go do that. That's on Meetup for, for more details on that one. On May 30th, we've got the Vera Wetlands Field Trip. And I'm going to skip that for a minute and I'm going to ask Harry to we in just a little bit uh, after I finish the rest of the upcoming events. But on uh, June 1st, then the Certify Your Garden announcement, National Wildlife Federation, you get a, a discount if you certify your, your garden and purchase a, uh, a plaque or um, a sign to put up in your yard. I, I went for the uh, upgraded, um, the, the nice sign, and we're going to put that in, in our, our yard. So I signed up for that. And then on June 1st, that starts the June challenge, and uh, that, that'll be a lot of fun. That's something that uh, is done across the, the state of Florida, and um, it's kind of a county by county friendly competition. So the idea here is uh, to go out and try and see as many birds in, in your county, or you can do other counties. Uh, uh, in previous years, I've done Orange and Brevard County in the same year. Um, but the idea is to try to see as many birds as you can during the kind of summer doldrums. So down here in, in our section of the woods, things get really slow in June. 
in northern Florida and southern Florida, they seem to have a higher number. So it's kind of interesting to see how that that works out. Um, but um, I'm unfortunately, well, fortunately, I'm going to be gone for two weeks uh, out at, in Utah doing some birding out there and visiting the national parks and spending some time with family. So I won't have as big of numbers probably as I have in the past years, but I'm going to keep trying. And then I put a, out there a bin in the future for September, the International Coastal Cleanup. Uh, and that's an announcement. It's not a, a Space Coast event, but something for uh, something else for people to get involved in. And then uh, probably over the next week or so, I'm going to try and figure out a, one or two field trips to do uh, at the beginning and the end of June to help us with our June challenge uh, activities. Um, so going back to the VR wetlands real quick, I'm still planning on, on having uh, that field trip, but uh, Harry made us aware that um, there have been some changes at the county level as to the administration of the wetlands. Um, my understanding is it's still open and we can still go there and, and have the field trip, but if something should happen and we're not able to get in on, on May 30th, then my plan is to head up to uh, Crookshank Sanctuary and we'll uh, do our birding that day. But Harry, do you have anything that you could um, pass on to our members about the Vera wetlands? Right. Uh, thanks, Bert. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, first of all, I've been a volunteer for the last eight years uh, through the County Department of Natural Resources. And the volunteer rangers, as they were called, primarily uh, closed up the facilities. We didn't open up the, uh, the gates. That was uh, always done by the utility services, which have primary jurisdiction. Uh, but we would be the ones that would pass out information, uh, do various maintenance projects, uh, including uh, filling in potholes in the road. Um, but we also installed some of the benches uh, and the like. Well, effective earlier this week, uh, the utility services decided they did not want any further involvement uh, in the wetlands from the Department of Natural Resources and that they will handle it going forward. Uh, what this means uh, uh, for people who visit there, uh, two aspects of it. Uh, we were told expressly that there will be no more maintenance out there. So as some of the facilities like the gazebo, the observation platform, uh, the uh, benches and the like, if they deteriorate, uh, too bad, they're gonna be trashed and, and, and removed. Uh, the other change, uh, which remains to be seen how it's going to be implemented is that historically there have been uh, later hours for closing uh, depending upon the months of the year. And utilities has advised that they intend to go to a uniform closing time. And although nothing was said as to what this means as far as hours, uh, just to use uh, uh, December and uh, uh, January as an example, I don't think they're going to close it at 8 p.m. I think it's going to be closed earlier. So ultimately, uh, my concern is what they're going to do is the schedule that you find up in Titusville at Blue Heron. In other words, uh, tie it into the termination or the quitting of the primary work uh, for shift and close it up around 3.30 or 4 in the afternoon and possibly not make it available to the general public on Friday, or pardon me, on Saturdays and Sundays. Um, remains to be seen what really happens there. Well, thank you. Thank you for that uh, insight, Harry. And, uh, you know, it's something where uh, maybe we as citizens need to try and understand from our uh, county commissioners and others um, how, how this decision was made and, and uh, yep. try, try and see what we can do to uh, make some changes there. I, I will say this, besides the article which was in Florida today that detailed the um, um, TIF that developed uh, when some of the people from utilities wanted to go down the low, uh, road uh, to do the water sampling and uh, people had parked cars there. Of course, there were no signs that said, don't park your cars there. Uh, and we would have been happy as rangers to put signs up that said that. Uh, 
But in addition to that, uh, on Tuesday when we had our ranger meeting where we learned this, we were also told that apparently there had been a violation of the water discharge quality requirements uh, by utilities and that the county uh, had entered into a consent order. Uh, no details on that, but consent orders usually say uh, this is the uh, uh, situation uh, you, you, you did something wrong, and if you do it again, uh, bad things will happen to the county. Well, as I said, we, for right now, what I've done is I've uh, created an alternate location in case we can't get in there. I may uh, change the hours of showing up to be 9 o'clock instead of 8.30, just to make sure the uh, utility services has uh, time to o open the gate, and then we'll... Uh, uh, hopefully be able to still bird out at Vieira wetlands, but if not, then we will um, head up to Crookshank Sanctuary and, and give that a try. I think there's a few people that said they're gonna try and go by tomorrow and see if it's open and, and hopefully I'll hear about that and understand what uh, the implications are, but we'll just- uh... um, Bert, can I ask a question? Sure. Okay, I, I wanted to ask Harry, Harry, um, I recall there was a pretty big group called Friends of Vieira Wetlands, and maybe that's part of what the Rangers are. I'm not sure. Is 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 that Friends of Vieira Wetlands still in operation? Um, that actually precedes the eight years that I've been doing. I've heard things uh, that uh, in the last couple years something went wrong with the Friends of Vieira Wetlands, and I don't know exactly, but. Uh, uh, that's that's all the information, the hard information I really have. Uh, the friends then of I have the Vera Vera wetlands do not exist as a separate entity. Okay. Then another question is: since this is county, um, is it now appropriate to write some letters to the county commissioners? The one thing about the Vera wetlands is this is an ecotourism destination equal to many other wetlands. Uh, there's the Green Key down in. <clears throat> Palm Beach County, there's the, of course, Orlando wetlands, there's the one up in Gainesville. These are huge ecotourism destinations, and I can't imagine the county would be willing to just let that go. Uh, that's, that's a fine suggestion, uh, uh, and a couple of things I just will elaborate. Uh, it's an ecotourism uh, destination, but it is also used by the Vieira companies as a sales point as why you want to buy a house in, Vie in Vieira. And for any of you who've been in that area of Wickham Road uh, South, uh, there's a ton of construction going on. The other thing, and it remains to uh, be seen whether any updating will really occur on a regular basis, uh, utility services uh, asked for uh, the Department of Natural Resources to relinquish uh, any control of the uh, website. Well, if utility services is doing that, it has to be approved by the county commissioners because they don't allow the departments to go around them or over their heads. So somebody on the county commission or multiple people may be fine with this. Uh, you, you, you may know more about how government is supposed to work. There was absolutely no mention of that uh, issue when the uh, about uh, 16 of us volunteers met with the two people from the du uh, uh, Department of Natural Resources to learn the bad news. Oh, all right. Well, uh, maybe time for, for people to write letters. We should at least pay attention and see if there's a time we should do that. Right. You should consider your commissioner, uh, the commissioner whose uh, district is that uh, where the wetlands is, is Kurt Smith. Okay, thank you. All right. Thanks, Heather. Thanks, Harry. Thanks, You're Bert. Welcome. Bert, were you, were you all done? Was that the last what you had? Okay. Thank you. All right. So thanks for all those updates. We hope to see you at future um, field trips, everyone. For those of you who are new, just to kind of highlight, to, to bring this in perspective, because we both have a lot of snowbirds and it gets quite warm here in the summertime, we go to a much lighter schedule and we generally do not have um, general meetings. So we do some a couple of activities over the summer, but we really normally come back in September um, as far as having monthly meetings. 
Um, in years past, prior to COVID, September was usually our welcome back, a little light topic. We would do a potluck. Um, we will um, look to give you some kind of update, send out emails and post it on Meetup once we have direction, as Jim indicated, from National on what's happening and whether or not we would have a September gathering. But we are definitely planning on one format and another from October going forward as far as monthly meetings. So I'm delighted to say that we will kick off our regular education series starting in the fall um, with a trip around the world with Disney. Um, so I have made a, a, a new partnership for us with the Disney Conference conservation fund leader, um, Dr. Jason Fisher. So he's going to come and give us a very interesting discussion about all the things that the Disney Conservation Fund does that they support um, from different places around the world and then the kind of lands back here at Animal Kingdom as one of the largest properties where we they manage, track, and um, monitor, survey um, Purple Martins. So for those of you who joined the Purple Patrol this year, and um, while it was a rough year for Disney because of COVID with, with visitors, it was a really good year for the birds and they were able to do tons of scientific data on them um, because they could spend time full time with the birds in many cases. So they're gonna be compiling that data over the summer and we'll be able to receive some of that information in the fall. So that is all of the stuff about the upcoming meetings. And then once we know whether we're in person or not, then I'll do the rest of the lineup for the rest of the year. Um, and then and, and we'll go from there. Um, so let's get on to tonight's wonderful speaker. Um, whoops, got a little um, clicker crazy there. So Sean Lee is, is, is familiar to many people because we are very fortunate to have a great number of our group participate currently or in the past in the Eagle Watch program. Um, she is, you know, it seems like she's just dedicated so many years of her life to um, helping the Eagles that we have. And Sean Lee, while you're switching over to your screen, uh, I just wanted to say that um, uh, I've, I've given you control. So if you want to take control of the screen and, and oh, sorry, let me just stop sharing real quick. Da, 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 there we go. Um, that um, we pay close attention because one of our members is going to be featured in this presentation with one of the photos. Um, but also wanted to highlight to everyone that part of this is also not only to educate you about the program and talk a little bit about the data, but there will be a chance um, to actually sign up um, if you're interested in becoming an Eagle Watch person for later for the season that's coming up. So I am going to post this presentation with that hyperlink in it um, out onto the website, or rather it's going to be Susan who does that. Um, so um, know that that'll be available inside the presentation and in, at, towards the end of the meeting, I'll also post it in the chat session. So Sean Lee, it's my pleasure to welcome you to the digital stage. Over to you. Thank you so much. Can everybody see my bald eagle slide? We do, and we hear great, you clearly. Great. Thank you. Wonderful. Um, I'm so jealous that Jason Fisher is coming to speak to your group. I worked at Disney for a number of years, and he's a good friend of mine, and uh, they do fantastic work. And uh, the area where I worked, we had several Purple Martin houses, and we'd take them down and check the babies and count them and all that. And it's even expanded since I was there. So that you'll be in for a fascinating talk. He's a lot of fun and the information is really interesting. So, but I'm here to talk about bald eagles <laughs> and Eagle Watch in particular. Um, so uh, Rochelle had asked maybe if I could have a bird with me. And of course, with the schedule with COVID and being somewhat at home and somewhat in the office, I am actually um, at home tonight. So I don't have any of the birds at home with me, but I, I try to give you a sneak peek into what my day is normally like at the office. And uh, doing that, I wanted to kind of show you uh, what I did today. Um, I work at the Audubon Center for Birds of Prey, and uh, I work in conjunction with the Raptor Trauma Clinic that treats all kinds of injured birds of prey. And we, I help them when it comes time for release of bald eagles. And today we released two juvenile bald eagles back into the wild. Um, so uh, this was a, a young bird that came from a, a nest in Seminole County in an industrial, very developed area. Um, and so it went back in the wild today. It's always exciting to see them take off and fly and get a second chance at life. And oftentimes these young birds are found by our volunteers. So it's always rewarding to get to have them involved. Um, this was actually a nest the Eagle Watch does monitor. So sorry, I don't have a live bird. I've got my stuffed eagle here. And uh, hopefully that video gives you a small glimpse into my daily life. It keeps me busy for sure. I've been in the role for almost five years now. Um, but the program's been around a lot longer and we'll talk more about that. 
But just kind of going over the basics of eagles, um, you know, I think a lot of you probably know a lot about eagles. You know, I'm speaking to Audubon folks and you all are bird nerds like I am. But, um, you know, it's always fun to look back historically at the population in our country. Uh, if you didn't know, bald eagles are only found in North America, so you won't find them outside of North America. Um, and they were very common in the United States when European settlers came here, you know, back in the day and started moving across the continent. And as, oh, you win. Whoop, as humans... Know, as humans began moving across and draining wetlands and cutting down trees and you know all the different things they were doing, it wasn't illegal to shoot bald eagles at that time. Uh, the numbers for bald eagles started plummeting, unfortunately. And you know, here's a historic photo of people with a couple of bald eagles they had shot. A lot of farmers thought they were attacking their livestock and other reasons. Um, to the point that even by the early 1900s, uh, people noticed they weren't really seeing any juvenile bald eagles. They were only seeing adults. And as you can, as you know, probably uh, juvenile bald eagles don't have the white head and tail, so they look quite different. And it's pretty obvious if it's not an adult. Um, so people started wondering, well, gosh, if we're not seeing any uh, juveniles, then what does that mean? Are there not any babies out there? What's going on? And so, you know, quickly people started thinking, what can we do to help the, the species recover? And, um, you know, they were they, the big issue for them really that kind of came about in the mid 1900s was DDT, the pesticide that kind of got into the waterways and infected a lot of the food sources. And because bald eagles are at the top of that food chain, toxins in the environment ride to the, rise to the peak. And uh, the fish and things that they were eating were infected with DDT and they were um, starting to not have as many viable eggs. Their eggs were affected, either they were soft shelled and wouldn't hatch properly or they were thin shelled and they would break. And anytime you have a population not having babies, um, that means it's going to go rapidly down. And that's exactly what happened. So finally, they realized that DDT was one of the main culprits that was affecting the population, uh, impacting their ability to reproduce. And once they banned DDT, they also took steps by adding the bald eagle um, to the threatened and endangered species list. It was illegal to shoot them anymore. Um, you couldn't capture them or do anything to harm them. All of these different protections kind of came together to help the species make a really wonderful comeback. Um, and so, you know, one other type of uh, conservation measure we don't often talk about, along with those federal protections and, you know, banning DDT, conservation measures um, like uh, captive rearing and uh, reintroduction, translocation, those types of things. Um, many states where they had totally lost their population of bald eagles went to maybe Alaska or down to Florida where we still had a decent number, and they brought babies or eggs to their state and hand reared them and release them with the hope that they would stick around. And so a lot of states saw great success that way, um, often partnering with uh, local zoos that would hatch and raise the chicks and then release them. In the lower right corner, you see what's known as a hack tower. And that's a very common system used with um, some organizations like the American Eagle Foundation where um, uh, the American Eagle Foundation actually has a captive pair of bald eagles that breed every year, but they can't fly. And they take those eggs and the young, when they're ready to be released, they put them in the hack tower and they can open the door and the birds can fly and come back and get fed until they're ready to take off on their own. And it's a wonderful way to introduce those birds back. Um, so they are very successful at the American Eagle Foundation as well. And then another way that I like to highlight because I work at the Center for Birds of Prey is um, the, the part that rehabilitation can play in uh, saving wildlife. You know, any bird that comes into our center and gets released really got a second chance at life. And uh, oftentimes, you know, that's the second chance they need to add more adults to the population, other babies to the population. And to date, the Center for Birds of Prey has released over 660 bald eagles back into the wild. So um, we've released a fair number of them out there, including the baby that you saw that I released today. Um, and some of the birds get released like you saw from the ground where they take off and fly. We release them when they're flying. Um, some of the babies, if they're young enough, we will actually put them back in the nest using a tree climber. And if they can't go back to the nest they came from, we will put them in a foster nest. And Eagle Watch data plays a big role in that. Um, if they have a young chick that can't go back to the nest it came from for whatever reason, um, I start looking at the data that the volunteers have collected and looking around to see where is a nest that has young of a similar age that we can actually access and get permission to go to and the tree is climbable in a number of factors. And so earlier this year, there was a nest on Honeymoon Island that actually had two chicks that the nest unfortunately collapsed after a storm. And one of the chicks perished in the collapse, but um, the rangers and volunteers got out there on a boat 
and brought the surviving chick back to shore and it was taken to a rehab facility locally and then driven to the Center for Birds of Prey. And that's the little nugget there on the left. Um, and so when it was ready to go, it still wasn't flighted. And we took it to another nest in Pinellas County that had one little chick in it of a similar age. And this is the video the tree climber took um, when he put the little baby up in the nest. <laughs> so it's uh, quite a view up there, as you can see, uh, when he shows out how high up they really are. It's pretty crazy. And uh, looking down the people at the bottom that were there to help and make sure everything went okay. So um, the good news is that little chick, uh, eagle wild, eagles, we say they either don't count or they can't care. They will raise young that are not their own. And they did actually raise that chick along with their little baby. And uh, the pair fledged together, those little babies fledged together as foster siblings in April. So it was really exciting to see. And we do ban the birds before we release them. So you can see the photo on the right is the, the banded sibling. They call her Muppet. And uh, she's flying around and doing really well. So super cool to see um, some of these birds again, get a second chance of life. And I know a lot of these birds that are banded go on to reproduce, we've seen that for sure. Um, so another great way to ensure their success. So all these different measures together, you know, starting from the 60s to 2007, the population made a massive comeback in the US. Um, at the point they were taken off the list of endangered species, they were at about 10,000 breeding pairs in the US. And then in Florida, they were at about uh, 1,200 or so. We had been down to 83 breeding pairs in Florida back, back in the day when they were listed. So they made a massive comeback. Um, these days, the latest estimates from US Fish and Wildlife, they estimate that there are about 70,000 breeding pairs of bald eagles in the lower 48 states and roughly 2,500 breeding pairs um, in Florida. This is recent data that just came out as of the end of 2019. So. The good news is they are doing well. And it is really one of my favorite things about bald eagles as a conservationist and someone who cares about birds, knowing that when you take steps to protect them, you really can make a difference. And bald eagles are always a reminder of that for us when you get you know, kind of overwhelmed with all the negative news on TV about species decline and other things, climate change. But um, eagles are doing really well in our state, which is great. Living here in Florida, we do have one of the largest populations of bald eagles outside of Alaska. And so anytime you go out birding, you're likely to see them. And it's a real blessing to live in our state and be able to see these guys on a regular basis. I mean, they're a beautiful, magnific magnificent bird. They're our national symbol. Um, everybody pretty much loves bald eagles. It's not a hard, um, you know, hard species to sell. People love them. And, you know, here in Florida, they are actually a little bit smaller. If you head up north, up to Alaska, especially the eagles, as you head north, get larger. And that's kind of a biological mechanism that helps them conserve heat in the colder climates. But here in Florida, they're a little bit smaller. So our males here weigh about eight pounds, females about 10 to 12 pounds. And uh, they are quite long lived. The oldest in the wild was 37 and when it passed. And they know that because it was banded as a baby in its nest. And then 37 years later, unfortunately, it was struck by a car. And when they recovered the body from the side of the road, they traced the band back to the original banding record and found out that it was 37. So in captivity, of course, you don't have to worry about getting hit by a car and they have regular medical care. Um, they can live up to 50 or more. So very li long lived bird, hardy bird. Um, and they are you know, mostly fish eaters as you think of. They also will scavenge, which is uh, unfortunate for them. They do often get struck by cars scavenging on dead animals along with vultures on the side of the road. And it, they get into trouble that way sometimes. Um, but they, you know, don't really carry off huge pets. A lot of people always want to ask me, like, is it going to take my chihuahua? Maybe your chihuahua, but probably not your um, cocker spaniel. They can't really carry anything much more than four or five pounds um, to lift off. So they're not going to waste their time unless they're really, really hungry or starving. Um, they also do show reverse sexual dimorphism. And in raptors, uh, the females are bigger than the males. So this is true of owls, vultures, and all the raptor species. So you can see here, um, it's kind of hard to tell if you only see one eagle by itself, but if you see two of them perched together, um, generally they don't hang out together unless they're you know, nesting or a pair during the breeding season. Um, so the female is the lower one in that picture and she is a, a little bit larger as you can see than the male. Um, and uh, she does rule the roost and kind of wear the pants in the family, so to speak. She has a lot to say about nest construction and where the sticks go. And uh, the, good, the good exciting thing about eagles is they are 
uh, pretty much considered monogamous. They do come back to the same mate every year, as long as that mate's available. And they do come back to the same nest territory and usually often use the same nest every year. And they work on it at the start of the season, kind of doing some, we call it nest durations, getting it ready for the next season. Um, and so that's always a fun time to watch them when the male brings a stick back and the female grabs it and says, that's not where I wanted it. And she puts it over here or she throws it over the edge like that's not good enough. <laughs> um, they're pretty comical to watch when they're going through that phase. They do have the largest bird nest of any um, you know, species here in North America. They can be you know, 10 feet across and sometimes 12 feet deep. The largest one ever recorded was actually in St. Petersburg, Florida, and it weighed two tons when it fell. Um, so they can be like a, you know, a small car in a tree. But having said that, I can't tell you how often I've gone out to try and find a nest that I know is there and I cannot find it. So they can also camouflage really well, um, depending on where they're at. And it can be hard to see and tricky. So my, my volunteers definitely have their work cut out from them when they're out looking for nests and so on. Um, we do mostly see them nesting in pine trees in Florida, um, bald cypress sometimes, occasionally, very rarely, an old dead oak. Um, but here in Florida, we're also seeing them nest on man-made structures now as well. So that's also very interesting. Um, they're, uh, you know, if you head outside of Florida, some of their nesting habits are a little bit different. Um, they've got, you know, out west in the mountainous areas, they nest on sides of cliffs. Um, and even in the outer, um, some of the islands off the coast of Virginia that are uninhabited, apparently they don't have any ground predators out there. Biologists have recently found that um, eagles are nesting on the beach, which is really strange to nest on the ground like that. But like I said, you know, if they don't have any trees and there aren't any predators, I guess you, you make do. And it's one of the things I love about birds. They're always, you know, doing something you don't expect and finding a way to do something interesting. So um, super cool there. They also have documented eagles nesting in giant cactus in Arizona. And then here in Florida, of course, we do see them on cell towers and power line towers and um, light, you know, light poles and so on, other crazy places. And um, we really see this more here in Florida than I've heard anyone else talk about in other states. So um, our eagles are kind of on the cutting edge of, um, you know, trying some different things and seeing if it works. Um, their breeding range used to be considered to be probably a mile or two around their nest. Here in Florida, that has significantly shrunk. I have active nesting pairs nesting less than half a mile from each other now. And in the past, that was considered, you know, not going to happen. But they're extremely territorial. They don't like other adults anywhere near their nest, and they will fight to the death. Um, at the start of the breeding season every year, the center takes in a number of eagles that are come in from territory fights, and some of them don't make it you know, from their injury. It's very sad. Um, so they are not joking around when it comes to defending their territory. And uh, so you might see some of those fights at the start of the season, um, you know, adults escorting other adults out of their territory. And once they start to settle down to breed, um, they've got their nest ready, they start laying eggs. They lay up to four eggs and they lay them about every other day. And they don't, they start incubating right away with that very first egg. So that means if they lay three eggs, the first chick might be a week older than the last chick. And so you do see some of that sibling rivalry in the nest. Um, sometimes the smallest chick may not make it, it gets out competed for food and so on. Um, the good thing in Florida is we do have a pretty healthy food source. And so we do have a fair number of nests that still raise two and sometimes even three chicks, which is great. When the chicks are, you know, when the eggs are in the nest or the chicks are really small, um, the adults do have to sit on the eggs at all times and also very small chicks. Um, they need to keep the eggs warm so they develop properly so you won't ever see really the nest left alone for more than 15 minutes or so while eggs are there. There will always be a bird in the nest. Once the chicks hatch, you'll see an adult brooding them to keep them warm. They can't regulate their own body temperature until they're about four weeks old. Um, so you'll see adults taking care of them, sitting on them, sheltering them from the rain or the heat. And then as the chicks get bigger, the parents are bringing food in and you'll start seeing the babies get left alone for longer and longer periods of time. And the, uh, you know, it's fun. The parents start dropping the food off and then letting the babies tear the food themselves instead of feeding them. So all the different little stages they go through. And as the babies grow rapidly, very rapidly, um, by the time they're ready to leave the nest, it takes about 10 weeks, 10 to 14 weeks for them to grow from egg to leaving. Um, and they start flapping their wings and exercising. And that's usually in the spring. So our breeding season starts in October, typically ends by May. Most of our babies fledge the nest in February to April. Um, so this springtime is always busy at the center too, as babies are getting exuberant and flapping their wings. Sometimes they get blown out of the nest or in a storm and come to our facility for help before they're ready to go out into the wild. 
So you can see just a quick picture of what they look like as they're growing. Um, you don't, you know, the nests are so deep and so high in a tree, you know, don't normally see what they look like until the little bobblehead pokes up above the nest. And that's usually at that 30 day mark when they've got the cute little white mohawk. Um, but we have a lot of nest cams that are out there on bald eagle nests. Those are a great way to kind of see a bird's eye view, so to speak, of what goes on in the nest and what they look like when they're really tiny as they keep growing. Um, so like I said, about 10 to 14 weeks, they're ready to leave the nest. They aren't entirely self-sufficient when they take off. Um, as you can see here, they look a little bit different than the adults. They are completely brown, except for their legs. Their legs and feet are yellow, just like the adults, but their beak is brown, their eyes are brown, tail and head are brown, um, and they have their wings are a little bit longer, their wing feathers a little bit longer than the adult. Uh, and that is kind of nature's way of giving them training wheels. If you have longer wings, it's easier to learn to fly, longer feathers, I should say. Um, so as they take off that first flight, um, you'll see those beautiful brown birds soaring around. They do usually hang out with their family for a couple of weeks um, because they're, you know, they need a little coaching. Um, the parents show them the great hunting spots, how to catch food. The parents supplementally feed them for a couple of weeks until the babies are starting to consistently catch their own food. Um, and so then as they're growing each year, the bald eagles will molt their feathers. And as they grow each year, they molt in more white feathers on their head and tail, and they kind of go from the brown bird um, into the speckly teenage stage at about two and a half. Their beak is growing continuously like your fingernails, and so it changes from brown to yellow as it's growing out, and their eye actually starts to lighten as well. To the point by the time they're five, they're considered sexually mature at that age, and then they have that full head of, and tail that's beautiful and white like we know, completely solid on the, the bottom brown. It's always the telltale sign if you're confused, if you see a bird flying that maybe you think it's an eagle. Um, you know, the ospreys don't have the solid brown belly, so you can always look for that. Osprey and eagles often get confused. Um, so at five years, they're ready to breed and uh, ready to settle into their own territory. But for the first few years of life, the bald eagles do actually um, migrate according to banding studies and satellite tracking. Young birds will leave Florida after they fledge and they'll head up the Atlantic Flyway, some of them going as far as Canada. And they kind of hang out there for the summer and join themselves. And then they come back at the end of the summer and roam around the state a bit and go harass other people and birds. And then each summer they'll do that again. And so uh, usually by their fifth year, they'll kind of settle down here in Florida if they've got a breeding territory. Um, so it's really interesting to see where they go with their different satellite tracking and different uh, band studies. But here in Florida, as we talked about, the population's been doing fairly well, but they, you know, they still face pressures in our state. I grew, I moved here in 92, and the changes in the state, even in that time, has been really crazy. Um, you know, like the loss of habitat, the development, the ongoing roads being built, and so on. Just so many pressures that they face, uh, you know, environmental toxins, uh, car strikes, electrocutions, and climate change. These are all things that still our concerns for the species and still possible causes for decline, which is one of the things we definitely keep our eye on. Um, just talking a bit about each one of those reasons and pressures individually. Um, we talked a bit about habitat, as I said in Florida, you know, as natural habitats getting destroyed, it's squishing the, the breeding territories into smaller and smaller areas. And we, you know, down here at Joe Overstreet Road, I believe that's where that is. Um, we have like three, four nests that are within half a mile of each other. So. Um, you know, they've learned to live amongst each other, which is good, but on the right or the left, you see a picture of a bald eagle that was involved in a territory fight. You can see the severity of the wounds and the, what they do to each other, um, quite serious. So, um, you know, some of the eagles are adapting and not fighting as much, and hopefully that's what will continue. Uh, competition. Uh, great horned owls don't like to build their own nest, and they are very fierce. So even though they're technically smaller than a bald eagle, their grip strength is stronger than a bald eagle, and they will drive bald eagles out of their nest. And every year within Eagle Watch, some of the nests we watch, you know, we get probably 15 or 20 nests each year that get taken over by great horned owls. Um, and if an owl takes over an eagle nest, typically the eagles will just move somewhere nearby and rebuild. And that's always the key is trying to figure out where they move to. Osprey also will fight with eagles. Um, some of the eagles are moving into the typical platforms that osprey would usually use. And so there's often some battles for those territories and turfs going on um, during the beginning of the nesting season as well. 
And then the toxins that mainly affect eagles, the main one still is lead. Uh, and that is because bald eagles are scavengers. So they're eating animals that have been shot with lead bullets and they're foraging on those carcasses and the intestines and the you know, organs and such where the lead uh, you know, concentrates. And it will actually send them into a coma and they can pass away from that. We got a lead eagle um, about a week ago that was in a coma when they picked it up, basically was like eyes closed down on the ground. Um, and it's made a full recovery once you get them to a place for rehab and they flush the toxins out and treat it with different methods, um, you know, they are usually be able to go back in the wild. Uh, pesticides always also an issue as well, ongoing um, barbiturates, which is an interesting one. Uh, this happens a lot with eagles that hang out at landfills. So a lot of our younger eagles, immature birds that are not breeding yet, love the landfill because there's lots of food there, lots of, you know, rats and other things running around, easy pickings. But there are also sometimes, uh, you know, animals that get euthanized at, at clinics and other places like that that aren't uh, cremated. They may go to the landfill for disposal and they're supposed to be buried at a certain depth, but that doesn't always happen or maybe they get uncovered somehow. And if eagles eat those animals that have been euthanized, they get secondary toxicity from that barbiturate um, poisoning and they can actually go into another, you know, into a coma and pass away. The bird here in this picture actually was recovered from a landfill and she had eaten something that had been euthanized. Um, they thought she passed on the drive down to us, but she actually was still alive. And like within a week of fleshing that toxin out of her system, she was released back in the wild and doing fine. So it's good news. Rodenticide is another issue. Um, they, uh, not so much for the adults, but really for the young back in the nest. If adults are hunting in an uh, urban area where there's a lot of rodenticide being used around businesses, um, if they catch a rat that's ingested rodenticide, if they take it back to the nest and feed it, feed it to the nestling, that smaller body size is much more susceptible to the level of rodenticide that might be in that rat. Um, there was a very highly publicized, unfortunate passing of a young chick that was in a nest with the nest cam in uh, Southwest Florida last season. Um, the parents brought a rat back to the nest that apparently had eaten some rodenticide. And what happens is it, it affects their ability to coagulate their blood. And so when the baby, you know, the little eaglet was eating the rat. Later on, it was picking at some of its feathers as they were growing in, and they have a, a blood source that comes in through the feather in a shaft. And uh, until that blood source closes off, if you break that feather open, it will actually bleed, they can possibly bleed out from the blood source coming out the feather. And that's what happened. It accidentally picked a spot on its wing and it started bleeding. And because it had that um, issue with the rodenticide, it couldn't coagulate its blood and ended up passing in the nest. So still a very serious issue. Avian vacular myelinopathy is a, a new thing that's kind of looming on the horizon. It's really affecting eagles north of us so far, knock on wood. Um, it is a bacteria that's getting onto the hydrilla, the plants that float on the surface of the water, and then the coots eat the hydrilla and get the toxin, and then the bald eagles eat the coots. Um, and so it, it's like a neurotoxin for them. So eagles north of us, as even as close as Georgia, they've had incidences of this happening. So um, biologists in the state are definitely, you know, monitoring for instances of that here in our state. Hopefully, maybe we won't see it um, like they're seeing it elsewhere. But again, talking about the human interface, always the big issue. We have a lot of people in Florida, more people moving here every day, more roads being built. Um, vehicle strikes are a big issue with the scavenging that they like to do on the side of the road. Um, fishing hooks and line are always a big issue every year. Uh, this picture in the middle, you can see the fish hook here. What happened was it was a nest off of uh, Lake Cassini, and the parents brought a fish back to the nest that had, you know, been caught by a fisherman, and then he cut the line. And when the parents brought the fish back, the hook was still in it, and the baby started trying to tear the fish and got his feet stuck in one end of the hook and his beak stuck in the other, and then he couldn't extricate himself, so he was basically hogtied, and he was like bobbling back and forth and couldn't um, get himself loose. Thankfully, this nest was in a backyard of some people that are a part of Eagle Watch and they have a nice scope up on their balcony and they watched the nest and they could see that it was acting weird because it was bobbling and it wasn't lifting its head. And so they finally could see what was going on and we got permission from Fish and Wildlife to go out and access the nest to remove the baby and uh, get the fish hook out. It came to the center for a week or so for rehab and then we were able to release it back. Um, thankfully, you know, in these cases where we can help, we try to. Plastic debris, this is another sad case where some netting that was left on the side of the road got taken up to a cell tower nest and the baby got entangled in it. So we, we see incidences of that every year as well, unfortunately. That's really where kind of Eagle Watch comes in. It is the power of community science. You know, these are a lot of 
pressures that face the eagles in our country and our state. And, uh, you know, conservation is not a job that just I can do alone in my little office, me, or even with all the fabulous people at Audubon or the other organizations that are doing great work. It really does take, you know, regular folks that are out there, you know, working a job and, and spending their time on the weekend or volunteering their time to help us collect the data that's important for helping us track the health of the population. And community science is such a powerful resource. And so um, I love, the, you know, everything that happens really through this program is because of the amazing volunteers that are out there doing the amazing work. I'm just the person that gets to talk about it, which is great. Um, so we started out actually in 1992, so a very long time ago. Um, like I said, I came to the program five years ago, but it's been going on a long time. And it started off with 22 volunteers in three Central Florida counties. And at that time, of course, eagles were still listed, federally threatened or endangered. So you know, volunteers in Florida want to know how are the eagles doing in Florida? We've got so much development. What can we do to protect them? Let's start monitoring nests and collecting data and sharing that with the biologists. So um, as of last season, which um, this season just is ending, but last year, 2020, um, we were in 46 counties and we had almost 400 and almost 480 volunteers monitoring about 850 nests around the state. And I'm in the middle of crunching all the data right now from this season to see, you know, what that number is for this year. Um, but definitely it's grown. We're in, you know, a good portion of the counties in the state and a, a huge group of volunteers out there every year that go out and collect the data during the nesting season from October to May. Um, so kudos to all those guys that are doing the hard work. Quick overview map, you can kind of see where we're active. Um, this is a map of eagle nests that we monitor, so not a map of all the nests in the state. Um, the blue dots are nests that we actually monitor. So you can see we are, you know, by nature of the community science program, concentrated in some of the more urban areas where people tend to live, which is normal. Um, so uh, not as much up in the panhandle. It's very rural up there, a lot of undeveloped areas, a lot of nests that we can't get to to monitor. They're way out on private property or, you know, perhaps on the coast where you can only see them with a boat. Um, so uh, always room for growth, but definitely um, mostly down here in the central area where is our concentration. Looking at Brevard County, I tried to throw up a little slide for you guys, um, kind of showing what the monitoring is in your area. So these dots here represent historic nests that have been documented. Some of these may no longer exist. Some of them may not be active. The blue dots are nests that Eagle Watch monitors. The red dots are some of those nests either we don't monitor or maybe they're historic and they don't exist anymore. Um, but a fair number of eagle nests in that you know, Brevard County area. Last season in Brevard County, we had about 18 volunteers monitoring 25 nests and we had 32 fledglings from Brevard County. So it was a productive year for that county and um, hopefully it will be again this year. We'll see how it goes. So those are the main things we do as volunteers. Um, you know, mainly we're we're not counting eagles per se. People often want to tell me about an eagle they saw, which is always exciting. But we really focus on monitoring the nests themselves during the breeding season, figuring out where the nests are, documenting the locations, collecting the data as far as how many chicks hatched, how many survived to fledge, um, identifying threats and disturbances, and educating the community, et cetera. Um, so one of the main things, of course, I always say the first step to protecting nests is knowing where they are. And, uh, you know, eagles, as new eagles are coming into the population, setting up their territory, we find new nests every year. And we found over 150 new nests over the last season. And some of these are relocations. If they got kicked out by owls or their nest blew down in a hurricane, they'll build another nest. Um, so knowing for sure where they're at is a huge step. And we do map and document all the nests. Um, that used to be done by Florida Fish and Wildlife. And at the start of this recent nesting season, they. Um, announced they were stepping back from that service. They're no longer maintaining their nest map or um, documenting the nests. And they kind of turned the reins over to Eagle Watch. So we maintain a public nest map that is based off of their map and it has all of the nests that we know about as well. Um, so there's a link that you'll see in the presentation when Rochelle puts it up on your website. You can always click on that if you want to take a, take a look and see where the nests are around the state. And then of course, collecting the data is the main thing as well, knowing where there are, but also how are they doing? So the nests that we monitor, we wanna know how many chicks hatched. And then the important thing is how many survived to fledge. So if you hatch a thousand chicks, but none of them survived to fledge, you basically end the season at a zero as far as adding birds to the population. So you wanna see that the population's growing. Um, last nesting season of the nests that we monitored, we had 800, I'm sorry, 900 chicks that hatched at the nests we monitored and 808 of those survived to fledge. So it was a pretty good season. It's about a 
90% floods rate. It was a little bit lower last year than it had been, something we're keeping an eye on. Um, as far as productivity, that is the number of fledglings from an occupied nest. So a nest where eagles showed up, looked interested in nesting, how many chicks did they fledge? Um, and it was 1.24, which again was a little bit lower than usual, but the average before that had been like 1.32. So it's not a huge dip, but just enough um, that I'll be curious to see, you know, is it gonna continue to go down? Um, even within any natural population, you do see fluctuation from year to year. Um, and sometimes you reach carrying capacity in some ecosystems where it can only su sustain so many breeding pairs. So we may also eventually come up against that here in our state. And even though the eagles have been removed from that list of threatened and endangered species, they are still protected by federal laws. They have the Bald and Golden Eagle Protection Act, which is the main um, law that protects them at the federal level and also the Migratory Bird Treaty Act. But the Bald and Golden Eagle Protection Act is the one that still says it's illegal to shoot them, you can't harm them, you can't cut down a nest tree without a federal permit. Um, you know, you're not supposed to annoy them or molest them and so on. And the, the one that we focus on a lot here in Florida with all the construction is the disturbance aspect. Um, so the, the fancy word they use is called taking of a bald eagle nest, but that can mean a, a bunch of different things. Um, the taking is can be considered disturbing. If you disturb a nest to the point that the eagles abandon the nest, they leave their young, they abandon the eggs, the nest fails, that's considered taking a bald eagle. And that is a federal violation subject to jail time and hefty, hefty, hefty um, penalties financially. So uh, it's illegal to disturb bald eagle nests during the nesting season. And that's something we see a lot here in Florida as people are trying to build their homes or build their businesses or build their roads. Uh, the federal government has come out with some guidelines, suggestions for if you have to do work near a bald eagle nest, we suggest you stay outside of 330 feet as long as you don't do work within 330 feet, you're probably not going to disturb the nest or cause take and probably not going to incur a federal violation. If you're doing really intensive work like mining or land, you know, blasting or land moving, um, they might take the, the buffer out to 660 feet. Um, in my time in this role, I've never seen the 660 foot buffer enforced. Generally, they focus on the 330. Um, but again, these buffers are guidelines. They are not laws. So it's not technically illegal to build a house 100 feet from a bald eagle nest. Um, if the eagles tolerate whatever work you're doing 100 feet from their nest, then it's okay, unfortunately. As long as the eagles aren't disturbed by the work, nothing illegal is happening. And that's one of the hardest parts, I think, you know, especially for volunteers who are watching nests that see construction going on. You know, sometimes the eagles really don't care. I mean, that's the good news, but also the, the knife edge, you know, like we wish they would care. Um, and they'll just keep doing their thing. They're used to people. They live in urban areas. They just carry on. I've seen houses go up 100 feet from a nest and the people, the birds keep coming back and nesting there every year. Um, but, you know, we do want to be there, the eyes, you know, for the birds in those cases where the eagles are disturbed by the work. Um, if it's ever going on and you notice eagles are being disturbed by the work, we can always get Florida Fish and Wildlife involved. They are the authorities to enforce the federal laws that protect the nests. And so all my volunteers have that uh, wildlife hotline number on speed dial to call if they ever have concerns and the law enforcement can come out and investigate to see if they think a violation is occurring. And that really is their call to make. We're really there just to kind of get there, you know, let them know what's happening. And then they have to do the investigation because it is a federal violation. It's almost like proving a murder. You know, you have to have irrefutable evidence, documentation that you can take someone to court over this and say you caused disturbance at the nest. So it's a very serious issue. It can't just be he said, she said. That's why I always encourage volunteers to make sure they document with photos and video anything you see going on because that could be helpful for the officers to determine if there was a violation. So all that talk about violations, it is a big part of what we see each year as we monitor nests. Every year, you know, about 100 or more nests that we monitor deal with some sort of possible disturbance, whether it's construction or you know recreational activity people riding their ATVs under the nest or um, you know drones especially are a big issue these days um, this is actually a nest that's right in Brevard County Greg is here on the the zoom meeting he and his wife joined Eagle Watch um, and they have been helping monitor some nests they actually reported this nest um, that is right in an area where there's a huge development going on and they've been great ambassadors for eagles and for the program working with local um, officials and government and the developers and building good relationships 
you know, it's always better to win friends rather than create enemies, especially in these cases, you know, to try and find common ground where we can all um, agree to disagree sometimes on some of the fine details, but try um, try to work together and, and find a way that we can all um, be happy with. And sometimes that's not always possible, but I really have appreciated Greg and Sue and their um, hard work with this nest and making sure that, um, you know, everyone's aware of where it's at and taking steps to protect it. And they do have a federal permit for their work there. Um, so that's the good news. Other things we might find as we're watching our nest this year, we had a nest that had a giant fish cast net on the side of it. The adults were doing their nestoration and grabbed a stick that was attached to a net and brought it up to the nest. And it was right at the start of the season, right at the beginning of October, they hadn't laid eggs or anything yet. And so we quickly got permission from Fish and Wildlife um, to access the nest and, and worked tirelessly to find someone with a high reach that could get up that high. And um, the uh, tree climbing company donated their time and went up and removed the net from the nest. The concern was once the eagles started laying eggs and raised their chicks, that maybe one of the chicks might get entangled in the mesh and we didn't want that to happen. So big kudos to Rosemary, the volunteer for that nest, you know, all her legwork finding the tree company and the wonderful tree company that donated their time. So these are all things that we see every year, um, exciting things, sometimes heartbreaking. We do have a lot of partners that we work with, um, U.S. Fish and Wildlife, Florida Fish and Wildlife, also a lot of the power and communication companies because the eagles are nesting on their structures now. Um, they want to, you know, talk to us about nests that we know about. How are they doing? Are they active? And oftentimes they help us as well. In this case, this photo was a kind of goofy, immature bald eagle that stopped at a cell tower and then somehow, we're not quite sure how, slipped and got its wing cut in, caught in between some of the metal bars on the um, cell tower and could not get itself loose. And it was hanging there struggling and struggling. Um, and thankfully, um, you know, people that watched the nest had seen it and were able to contact the cell tower company that owns the, that tower. At every tower at the base, there's a fence. And on the fence, there's a sign that tells you who owns it and who to call. And they sent some teams out and they climbed the tower and were able to get that bird loose and it was able to be released back into the wild, thankfully. So um, we do appreciate our cell tower partners and Florida Power and Light and the other folks we work with, Duke Energy and so on. So like I talked about, um, you know, a number of nests here in Florida are on artificial structures now. Actually, within the nests that we watch in Eagle Watch, 20% of them are on cell towers and power line towers and Osprey platforms and things like that. So. Um, this is kind of artificially skewed because we are more active in urban areas where you do see a lot of, you know, cell towers and things. Um, Florida Fish and Wildlife, last time we talked about it, they estimated statewide. The estimate was probably closer to 10% just because there are a lot of great swaths of areas that are still undeveloped where eagles nest in trees. Um, but within Eagle Watch, we are definitely keeping an eye on the statistic and really wanting to know, you know, are eagles that are nesting on cell towers as successful as the eagles that nest in trees? So every year, um, I break out this information as I look at productivity to see how they're doing. And the good news is that, you know, over the last four seasons, at least eagles on cell towers have been just as successful as eagles in trees. And last season, actually, for some reason, the eagles on cell towers were, um, they did much better than the eagles in trees. Um, 1.36 fledglings versus 1.21 for the natural nests. And it wasn't so much that the mortality was different. They both had about the same mortality. So about the same number of chicks that hatched survived a fledge. Where it really was different was kind of the, the brood size, I guess you would say. More of the cell towers hatched and fledged two chicks and more of the natural nests tended to only be one chick nests last year. So again, something we'll look at this year as we consider um, you know, looking at how they're doing as well. And we kind of wanted to take a deeper dive into some of this data thinking down the road you know, as these birds that are starting or hatching on cell towers in five years when they're ready to nest, are they going to want to nest on a cell tower themselves? Um, will there be any influence on the type of nest they came from as to what they pick as an adult? And so uh, four or five years ago, we started an auxiliary banding study, um, partnering again, you know, permission from U.S. Fish and Wildlife and all of that. What we're doing as baby birds or baby eagles come into the clinic for treatment at the Center for Birds of Prey, if they're released back into the wild and we know what type of nest they came from, they get a special auxiliary band that's colored and based on the type of nest. It's green if they came from a natural nest and it's black if they came from an artificial structure. And uh, we also DNA sex them to see if they're male or female. And then we release them into the wild. And hopefully, you know, over time as those first birds from the first cohort 
Um, from 2017, reach breeding age, it'll be interesting to see what choices they make. And so I think next year is the first year that our first batch of birds will actually turn five. So possibly some data next year, we'll see. It may take another year or two. Um, but it's really interesting to look and see so far since 2017 season, we have banded and released 67 eaglets from the Center for Birds of Prey with these auxiliary bands. The great thing about them is they are really easy to see. If you've ever seen a banded adult bird um, that has just silver federal band on it, it's got nine digits stamped into it. That's like a social security number. You have to be able to see all nine of them to identify the bird. And you can almost never see all nine of them. It's really frustrating. Um, so in addition to the silver band that you can't read, we've added the auxiliary band. So it has one letter and two numbers, super easy to read. So we've already seen um, a number of recites come through. Most of our birds that we've banded so far have come from natural nests. And also the majority have been females, which has been interesting. Uh, I don't know if they're you know, more precocious because they're larger and they jump first, who knows? Because most of the ones that come to our center often are birds that fell out of the nest too early. Um, maybe they got to rambunctious and jumped or blew out or something. So we'll see how that continues to trend that way or not. Um, with recites, we've been really excited to see, you know, bird recites after you ban them, sometimes it can take up to seven years before you see any of your birds recite banding come in, um, you know, according to research studies. But so far we've had at least eight of our juveniles um, recited a year or two or more after they were released. And that's always fun to see, you know, that three-year-old bird out there doing well and knowing that it's out there because it got a second chance. Um, we've had some of them recited out of state. We had one that made it to Ohio like a week after it was released in, uh, I think it was Lake County, it showed up in Ohio and West Virginia, and also um, one over in Cape Hatteras last year. So they take that migration up and come on back. And we also have this one crazy bird. Oh, I actually, I uh, thought I'd included the photo, but I took it out. We have one bird we call Eugene. Um, she was, they thought she was a boy, but she turned out to be a girl. She was released the first uh, year of the study. And she has been seen, I think, six or seven times. She's like our little golden child eagle. <laughs> um, she hangs out over at the Manatee Landfill and Honeymoon Island area. And uh, so we have lots of good photos of her flying around. And we've seen them at Circle B. Um, where else have we seen them? Other places. So it's always fun to get those band reports. If you ever see a green or a black band, please let me know. Um, so how, how you can help, of course, you know, Many different ways, you know, if you don't have the time to do Eagle Watch, obviously uh, lots of different ways to help eagles in general. They are, you know, kind of at the top of the food chain as you're doing things that help them be successful. You're helping a number of animals underneath them that live in that same habitat. Um, so keeping it clean out there as far as picking up your garbage, you know, be aware of your plastic waste, reduce, reuse, recycle. Um, you know, say no to toxins if you're using pesticides or rodenticide, maybe investigate other ways to control pests in your area or your business. Um, if you're out and about and you see something going on near an eagle nest that doesn't look right, people are, even sometimes it's with photographers, we talk about eagle etiquette here in a second, but anything that might be disturbing eagles while they're nesting, or if you see a nest that looks in danger, they're plowing great swaths of trees down and there's an eagle nest out there, you know, call the Fish and Wildlife Hotline, um, you know, let them know something's going on, let them go out and check it out. And eagle etiquette, again, uh, you know, thinking about the space they need to raise their young peacefully and just being respectful of that, um, you know, making sure you give them their space. With an Eagle Watch, we generally ask our volunteers to respect that 330 foot buffer and stay back as they're watching the nest, you know, use you know, binoculars, spotting scope cameras from a distance and not try to get too close to get a better picture or whatever it is. Really, you generally see better farther away, any, especially if it's a cell tower because that angle is really strict. Um, but just making sure that we're giving them that nice quiet place to raise their young. Don't use drones. Drones are prohibited in eagle watches, but you know, not used during the nesting season, et cetera. It'd be very disturbing to eagles that are nesting. And then if you see a nest, um, you know, always check our map or send me a note to ask if it's one we know about. You'd be surprised how often I hear about a nest that's been in a neighborhood for 10 years and no one just, no one ever thought to tell anyone about it. <laughs> and so, yeah, if you know about a nest, just you know, give us a call, let us know if it's one we know about, we can um, map it and assign an ID. So it's always one of my favorite emails to get as well. Um, and then Eagle Watch participation, if you're so inclined, 
Uh, we're on a break right now for the summer, but we'll start back up in the fall for the 2021 season. Um, so we do ask volunteers to commit to monitor their nest during the entire season. Um, if you're a young fledge in February, you're actually done for the season for that nest. But if you've got a nest that goes into May or whatever, you know, you'll continue to watch your nest till the young fledge or the end of the season. We ask you just to go twice a month, stay for about 20 minutes. Um, you know, it's not super hard. It's a beautiful time to be outside in Florida in the winter. So, uh, you know, just check your, month, your nest twice a month, put your data into our online database. We also have an app on the phone. You can do while you're sitting there looking, you can just put your data in so you don't forget. And uh, if you want to um, learn more about getting involved in Eagle Watch, there's a sign up form you can fill out. At this point, I'll just add your email to our listserv. And then in the fall, as I start planning trainings for new volunteers, uh, you'll get an email from me. So all volunteers do have to go through training before they start monitoring, just to make sure we're all on board with our protocols. Um, and then we'll work together to assign you a nest in your area. Or if you travel to certain areas to bird, you know, let me know. If you have a boat, that's good. Some nests can only be viewed by boat. If you like to go boating, keep me posted. Um, so yeah, we'd love to have you. We're always open to taking new volunteers and um, getting people signed up. So definitely reach out. Um, here's my email, eaglewatch at audubon.org. Um, you can reach me there or call at the center. I'm currently working still part-time from home and part-time at the center. Um, so Eagle, uh, the email is usually the best way to reach me because I'll see that more frequently than I will get the voicemail. Um, but um, I'm at the Audubon Center for Birds of Prey. If you're ever over in the Maitland, Orlando area, be sure to check us out. We are open every day of the week currently. Um, we're open 10 to 3 right now, restricted hours because of, you know, COVID and so on. We are still, um, you know, wearing masks on property. Uh, that may change in the near future, but we only do online ticketing. So if you want to come visit us, you can go to the, the website um, and reserve your time slot and come over and see us. We'd love to have you. It's $8 um, flat fee for admission, and that, that money goes to support all the different programs we do there, um, conservation, education, um, and so on, rehabilitation, as you can see. This was, I think, last week we actually released four juvenile bald eagles back into the wild. It's been a crazy season this year. We had 14 juvenile bald eagles in the clinic about a month ago. And typically we have six or seven at this time of year. So uh, all the storms and such, it was crazy, um, but always amazing to get to see them go back out in the wild. It is baby season for a lot of different raptors in the state and it is our busiest time of year. So our clinic staff are working nonstop and doing amazing work, raising the many babies that come to us every year, every day actually. Oftentimes from trees getting trimmed at the wrong time, um, unfortunately, or storm events happening. Um, super cute little babies. Like I said, um, Eagle Releases, of course, is my bread and butter and one thing I always love to be involved with. Um, so like I said, actually, that, I need to update that number. It is about 660 as of the last um, Eagle Releases we did. But we do have a raptor ambassador species you might get to meet if you come over. So let me know if you're coming. I'd love to pop out and say hi if I'm there that day for sure. And uh, we always appreciate your support. Um, we are a nonprofit organization and rely on support from individuals and foundations that you know, donate and grants and other you know, sources of funding. So um, we've been around a long time doing great work and all of my coworkers are amazing people. So, uh, so proud to be a part of Audubon, um, National Audubon and our state chapter and getting to see all of you guys and hear your stories about your birding adventures and um, always just refreshes my love for what we do and, you know, that we're all on the same team and this work together. So I hope you enjoyed this talk. Hopefully it wasn't too long-winded and boring. Um, if you have any questions, we can definitely take some questions here as Rochelle says we have time and or else, you know, reach out to me via email. All right. Thank you so much. Huge round of applause, Sean Lee. That was outstanding. Um, and uh, I know that we have a couple of folks who have um, raised their hand. So Heather was first that I saw. Um, and Heather's question, I told her I would verbalize it and then she can add some comments. Back when you were talking about um, pesticides and redundicide, I think is the correct pronunciation, um, and about them eating that from animals that have been euthanized, she was wondering if there's been any kind of campaign or any kind of education awareness sent to vets and sent to, to places that would do that to help, under, help them understand or be educated on the impact. Well, the, the issue is not so much with the vets, it's actually more of a problem with the landfill, not properly burying those animals. And so um, in the case where we see repeat issues at a landfill with multiple eagles coming in from that type of poisoning, 
Um, we actually have worked with the Department of Environmental Protection, and they will go out to, um, you know, kind of take a look, see and see what's going on and have some conversations with them, um, you know, just to make sure, you know, they're looking at their protocols and practices and following what they're supposed to do. So it's, you know, the vets themselves, it's really not their fault. It's just, you know, what's going on at the landfill, how it's being managed, that it's an issue. Um, so that's, you know, more of the side of where we try to do some education and we get the authorities involved if we have to. But definitely rodenticide is one thing that we do often, you know, try to educate people about. Some of my volunteers that watch nests that are in urban areas and businesses areas will go to the businesses and talk to them and have recruited them to not put out their rat bait boxes during the nesting season, you know, or move them away from wherever. So um, definitely that education is always great. And there are a lot of wonderful resources and posters and things you can print out and give to people as well. Okay, thanks so much. Um, I know we have several other questions, but there was a request to have you, if you could go back, I think it's one slide with all of the contact information, or maybe it's a few, that one. Yeah, if you wouldn't mind leaving that up, that would be okay. great. Um, Greg, did you want to say something? I mean, as somebody you were being featured in the presentation and as somebody that I know that was my first connection to you when you said, hey, I, I found this nest. Does anybody know about it? Uh, and, and I said, I know someone who's going to want to know about it, but maybe comment a little bit about what it's been like um, to be involved in the program this year. And you'll have to take yourself off mute. Uh -huh. There we go. So, so yeah, uh, what was kind of interesting was I had first heard about a a nest that was about 30 feet off of a subdivision at a city council meeting that uh, some people were complaining about. And so uh, using that information, I kind of put the feelers out. And of course, Rochelle, it went through you and up to Sean Lee. And that's when I was introduced to the Eagle Watch program. So uh, uh, after going through the training, I think it was right at the time you were getting ready to do the, the, the yearly training, Sean Lee. So Sue and myself went through the training. And of course, I guess one of the big problems is, you know, you got to follow the rules, right? So if you can't get to the nest from public property, you can't monitor the nest. So I had went round and round with the environmental consultant and okay, they went and they, they uh, uh, got the federal permit since they were gonna be 30 feet from this nest. But then I got a hold of the developer at, at a second council meeting and I said, well, you know, hey, you know what? I'd like to watch the nest. Would you give us permission? And he goes, well, sure as long as you sign a liability release because you're going to be in our active construction site. And it, it, so, so several things surprised me is one that uh, the developer was very accommodating, basically giving us free run of the construction site. And, and, uh, and then as part of the permit, they had set up a barrier at 330 feet out from the nest. So everything's going along great. We're, we're having a good time. We'd go out there with our little camp chairs and my spotting scope, and you'd hang out for a while. And like Sean Lee said, this is, you know, as we all know, this is a great time in Florida to be outside. So, you know, we're watching and, you know, we see them working the nest and we saw them incubating and we see the little gray fuzzy heads pop up. Fantastic. So as we're going along, though, we go out one day, and all of a sudden, the barricade's down, and there comes the picture of all of the dump trucks. So, of course, you know, you panic, right? We've never done this before, and oh, my God, you jump on the phone, and I tried to get a hold of uh, Sean Lee, you know, but she's a little tough on the phone, You're real good at getting emails. It's like, oh, okay, so I'll call Fish and Wildlife. So I call Fish and Wildlife and they have a duty desk. It's answered, I guess they answered this thing 24 hours a day. And they said, well, they took the information. Okay, we'll have somebody call you. Well, okay. So I hang up within, what, five minutes, the phone rings and it was the game officer. So I'm talking to this gal and I kind of explain the information. She goes, well, she goes, what you're explaining, it doesn't really sound like it's disturbing the eagles. They're, you know, and they are allowed to, you know, be that close. They had, 
they had put up signs about uh, no, uh, uh, and I like this one, not slamming the dump truck back doors. So what the guys were doing, and I mean, the truck drivers were really good. They'd go in, they'd dump their dirt, but instead of just pulling right away, they'd slowly ease off, and that back gate would just swing instead of the big boom, boom. And boy, I'm watching that scope for when that happens. Them eaglets, they weren't even flinching, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, so it was like, well, okay, you know, and uh, uh, then the next day, the uh, uh, FWC uh, eagle biologist for the whole state who I had talked to earlier when we were setting this whole thing up, he called me and he goes, yeah, he goes, you know, they're pretty resilient and it doesn't really sound like we need to send a, 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 an officer out there and stuff, but, you know, you see something, you let me know. I said, oh, okay. So it was just that that fine line, like you talked about, between, you know, a, as a true conservationist, it's like, oh my God, you can't touch that, to, to you know, well, are they really bothering the birds? No, nah, it doesn't look like it. Okay. And now we had two eaglets fledge from that nest, a good working relationship with the developer, and of course, we'll be back next October, because next October, they'll probably be building houses there. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it, it was a real education for me as far as just how you have to kind of, you know, walk the line between, you know, what the rules are, what the regulations are, the suggestions, and, and I don't know. So it, it was for somebody who was new to this, uh, uh, it was a very educational experience, <laughs> and and of course, every what maybe once a month it's Sean Lee. What about this? What about that? <laughs> and of okay. course, uh, uh, for uh, uh, for the Eagle Watch volunteers, there is a closed Facebook page, so you could go there and you could you know get some some basic questions answered, which was very helpful. So. Oh, good. Well, thank that was you our so much. Experience. Yay! Thank you so much, Greg and Sue Bull, for for both hel helping uh, you know share your experience and also the awareness to that particular nest. Um, Dee, I wanted you to weigh in. I think in terms of our group, I I may be corrected here, but I believe you're probably our longest Eagle Watch volunteer. What can you share about your experience or any special story? You know, my my first year. Um, a owl took over my nest and David found where they moved to. So the next year we raised one young. Last year there was two young that got fledged. And this was our first complete failure year. Um, we aren't sure what happened. We had seen um, powered parachutes flying, I thought way too close to the nest. Um, they were coming down the canal, which separated me from where I watched the nest to the nest. I can't say for sure, we, can, we don't know if that's what caused the nest to fail, but we did see like one fuzzy little gray head briefly, and then we never saw it again. And the parents stopped showing up at the nest. Um, so we aren't really sure what happened. We never found um, any, um, once we were sure the nest had failed, I did hike out to the, where the nest, to the nest tree, and I did not see any sign of like a dead baby bird on the ground or anything, or an injured baby bird on the ground. We didn't see any sign of it. So we don't know what happened. Um, oh. So, but it's been fun. We've been, I'm enjoying it. And David has his own nest on the other side of the park now too. So. Right. And are you guys at St. Sebastian? Yeah. River okay. That's what I uh -huh. thought. I know I, I've talked to you a couple of times where you've been on text back and forth when you're on your way to check them, check out your nest. So yeah. very excited to see that. Um, all right, so for anyone who is on video, if you have a question, if you just want to raise your hand like this, I'll call on you next. I'm trying to let, let me just go back to chat. Um, Jenny, did you have a question? I don't know if you're just thinking or if you had a question. It's nice to see you tonight. Nope, you're good. Okay. <laughs> uh, anyone else have a question that I missed? Let me go back to chat real quick. I think there might have been. Um, speaking of chat, um, if you have the ability to see the chat, I've done two things. Uh, first, multiple times to raise awareness. I did um, put a link, the link that's embedded in this presentation. I put that in there so that you can just use that link and go right to signing up to be a volunteer. Um, 
if you sign up now, you'll be on the list for when they get ready to do the training in the fall. And also, um, I, I influenced, I hope, Shali, that if you sign up now, that perhaps you can also, when she's done crunching the data from this year's season, that you can be on that list then to get the data as well. And then that, that nesting um, um, the map, Several people were very interested in that map. It will come with a presentation, but if you think, can't wait for a couple days for it to be posted, here's the link. I've created a Bitly link, which is just a short cut, a quick cut to get there, so it's there. Um, and with that, I see Anna has her hand raised. Anna, if you'd like to take yourself off mute and ask your question. Hi, thank you. Um, the question that I had was, is there a way that's preferable to handle them if you happen to ever see one displaced and want to transport it um, like you know should you maybe grab a shirt or a towel or something as opposed to handling them with your bare hand I'm a volunteer with the South Florida Wildlife Center down here in Fort Lauderdale um, so I don't know if they'll ever come that close to my area but I was just wondering just in case yeah, that's a good question. Um, you know, even though, you know, you think they're a baby, their talons are still very strong and they can be quite dangerous. So um, I generally encourage my volunteers, unless it's, you know, dire situation to, um, you know, we have a number of rescue organizations in the area that have people that are trained and uh, experienced with handling and catching raptors and bald eagles in particular. And so I usually recommend that people try to get someone to help that knows what they're doing, but in a pinch, you know, generally, uh, you know, there are a few things you can do, but you just have to be really careful because they definitely can be dangerous. You want to have gloves, um, you know, their feet are the main thing that they protect themselves with. So that's what they're going to try to grab with. And so, you know, if you have a shirt or a stick that you can kind of throw, sometimes they snatch onto that and they'll hold on to it and they won't let go for whatever reason. So um, sometimes you can throw a towel or a blanket over them and scoop them up. But again, you'll wanna you know, be very careful of the talons, even the beak, they don't bite as often, but they can bite. So I generally recommend that you get the authorities involved or a local rescue to come out and do the rescue. Um, if you ever have questions, we've always, we got a lot of contacts around the state, so we can always get help for you if you need it, just call us. Okay, thank you so much. And, and thank you, Anna, for joining us from Fort Lauderdale. Um, for those of you who are in Brevard County, um, just to let you know, Wild Florida Rescue, and I know um, Jenny's been a volunteer there, and I, I'm not sure if we, we occasionally have some other members of the team. Um, they have an ambulance here in Brevard mm -hmm. County, and they answer lots and lots and lots of different calls. Um, so you can always call them for assistance as well um, for wildlife transport. It's a good number to know in general, not just for bald eagles, but all sorts of wildlife. Um, many of you may have seen the fantastic news that was shared on social media the last couple of days about those bobcat kittens. I know that made several next doors as well as Instagram where the mom sadly was, was killed um, um, on the highway and they were on a search for the kittens. The kittens were found, they were taken to a rehab and they were, they're doing well. So, um, so thank you everyone for that. But while Florida Rescue, that ambulance is a wonderful resource to all of us for wildlife in general that does operate in Brevard County for those of you who are in Brevard County. Um, Greg, you look like you were kind of waving again. Were you just sort of like, yeah, yeah, yeah? Yeah, so you're good. All right. I'm just going to scan here to see if anyone else. I've got two screens of people. Um, and I see Greg and Linda. Or, sorry, Glenn and Linda. Good to see you. And let me just, Danny's joined. Thomas. Uh, oh, Charlie Venuto. Hi. I didn't see you earlier. Um, all right, I don't see any of their hands up for people who have their camera on. So for anyone else who doesn't have their camera on, I'm just going to see, is there any questions? If you want to ask a question, you don't have your camera on, um, you can just unmute yourself. Uh, let's just see. I don't see anybody else raising their hand. So um, for that, I will just say then, if um, Oh, thanks, Heather. Heather's put Wild Florida Rescue's website in the in the chat so that you all have that as well. And we're hoping if we're back this fall to have Wild Florida Rescue, we were working towards that before COVID shut us down to have them actually come to a meeting. Um, I know some of the volunteers have been at several meetings just in attendance, but hopefully to have a, a little table or something so that we can all meet them. Everyone can get the business cards and things like that. So it's first of mind um, as well. But 
Um, one last quick look. I don't see any other questions. Um, Kay, are you raising your hand or just adjusting the screen? <laughs> I think she says she's just adjusting the screen. No worries. It's hard to tell. <laughs> uh, well, certainly, I wanted to say this was absolutely fantastic. Um, I do hope that you all go over and visit the center. As a reminder, like she said, right now there it's online tickets, so please go online. They've gone. They've changed the pricing structure, so now it's a flat fee. Um, so that's great. And we hope that we'll go back, and we often have a, a field trip that's near there, and then pop in afterwards. So um, once things are starting to reopen further and there's more space that more people can come through. We'll look to still still do that. But um, in the meantime, check out those babies and all the stuff that's on the website that you can see. Um, and please consider um, making a donation as well to help them out because it is just a huge baby season as I think that's one of the positive outcomes, I guess I would say, is that people are finding things and more animals are getting help this year because so many people are home and seeing more things going on. But that just stretch our nonprofit so much as a result uh, but um Charlie, it was w wonderful so like i'd like everyone who's on camera to give a big round of applause hands up everyone yay thank you i see charlie said hi hi charlie um and thank you so much for joining everyone this evening we hope to see you at some of the events please do join the june challenge from wherever you are put some data in ebird let's let those numbers for the june look really good um and for general meetings we'll see you back in october um, and please keep an eye on both email and meet up as we know more from the national organization about what that format will look like in the fall. It's my pleasure to say good night, good day to all of you and happy birding. See you soon. Bye everybody. Bye. Bye everyone. Bye.